Hello. Welcome to our Pick of the Week Bible study. My name is David Fincher, and I'm the minister for the Church of Christ here in Wabash. We want to thank you for being here. This Bible study airs every Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. on both our YouTube channel as well as our Facebook page. If you're joining us on Facebook, please make sure you like the class if, in fact, you like the class, and share the class on your Facebook page if you're watching on our YouTube channel. Please like and share and subscribe and all the stuff that you do on YouTube. That way you'll be notified every time we stream this class as well as other lessons that we might stream from the Church of Christ here in Wabash. Tonight we're going to take a close look at this man called Jesus of Nazareth. I mean, he set foot on the face of this planet and changed everything. There's never been anyone like him. He is the most prominent human being that has ever lived. So tonight, we're going to investigate. We're going to reason as to why. Why is Christ the most prominent person who's ever set foot on the face of this planet? If you're ready, let's go. The theme of my preaching and my teaching has always been reason. In Isaiah, the first chapter, in verse 18, God said, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be like crimson, they shall be as wool. More than anything else, we must focus on God's word and what he has to say regarding everything that has to do with Christianity. God wants us to reason with him. He wants to reason with us. And if we will, if we will engage in that, then our sins, though they be as scarlet, will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be as white as wool. Come now, let us reason together this evening regarding Christ. Now, when I speak of Christ, I'm speaking of Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus, without a doubt, most famous person who's ever lived. He is the central figure of the human race. You can Google it, and in every list of the top 10 most influential people that have ever lived, Jesus is always number one. Google estimates that 130 million books have been written, and 40% of those books have been written about Jesus. Now, Islam sees Jesus as a prophet. The Buddhists see Jesus as the Bodhisattva, the enlightened one. Hinduism believes that Jesus was a god, but only one god of millions of gods. And Judaism believes that Jesus was a great Jewish teacher. We ask the question, who was he? How can we discern who and what he was. I mean, the books that record his words and his life are found within the pages of the Bible, four books, four books that are biographies of the life of Jesus. Three of them, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called the Synoptic Gospels. John sort of stands apart, but brings in things that Matthew, Mark, and Luke did not bring in. What makes Jesus the central figure of the human race? Why is he different than all the other individuals who came before him, be it religious individuals or just be it Einstein and other people that might have made an impact on this world? Was it the life that he lived in the public eye for three and a half years? Was it his words, the things that he said? Or was it both his words and his life? Why is Jesus the most influential person who's ever lived. Well, if you'll be honest with yourself, by the end of this lesson, I believe that you and I can know the answer to that question. And once you know the answer, then you got to ask yourself, what am I going to do with that? So the first thing that we have to do is ask the question, what did Jesus say about himself? That's an important question. 
What did he have to say about himself? What did he claim regarding himself? Jesus made unique claims. He made unique claims regarding himself. He claimed to be the Son of God in Matthew 26, verses 63 through 64. He claimed to be the giver of eternal life in John 10 and verse 28. He claimed to be one with the Father in John 10 and verse 30. He claimed to be one who forgives sins in Mark 2 and verse 10. He claimed to be the true vine in John 15 and verse 1. He claimed to be the great I am in John 8 and verse 58. He claimed to be the giver of living water in John 4 and verse 10. He claimed to be the future judge of all the world in John 5, 22 and 23. He claimed to be the savior of the world in John 3 and verses 14 through 16. He claimed to be the Messiah in John 4 and verse 26. He claimed to be the one that will actually command the resurrection of the dead in John 5, 28 and 29. He made seven great I am statements, employing the same terminology that God used about his name when he spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai. And when Moses said, what shall I tell the children of Israel that your name is? And he said, tell them that I am has sent you. Jesus used that statement, I am. And he said, I am the bread of life in John 6 and verse 48. He said, I am the light of the world in John 8 and verse 12. He said, I am the door in John 10 and verse 9. I am the good shepherd in John 10 and verse 11. I am the resurrection and the life in John 11 and verse 25. I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 14 and verse 6. And I am the true vine in John 15 and verse 1. The Sumus Maximus is when he said in John 8 and verse 58, before Abraham was, I am. That's important. The claims of Jesus stand unique and apart from all other individuals in history. And keep in mind that 105 to 108 billion people it's estimated that many people have passed through this world. His why he came statements become important because they imply something. Why he came. That means he came from somewhere. Every time he would speak in reference to why he came into this world implies he came from somewhere else. He was incarnate. It's a veiled reference to his incarnation. So we ask the question, what are those why he came statements? Well, he himself said he came to do the will of the Father. He came to save sinners. He came to bring light to a dark world. He came to be made like unto his people. He came to bear witness to the truth. He came to destroy the devil and the works of the devil. He came to give everlasting life to those who would come to him. He came to bring judgment into this world. He came to give his life as a ransom for many. He came to bring us back to God, to reconcile us to God. But that's not all he said. He also made judgment statements. He actually talked about the judgment day that he himself would preside over. He said that he will be as a shepherd dividing his sheep from the goats in Matthew 25 and verses 31 through 46, setting the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. In Luke 11 and verse 31, he made a judgment statement saying, the queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them for she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. In Luke, the 11th chapter, in verse 32, he said, The men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. In Mark, the 14th chapter, verses 60 through 62, the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? What is it that these witnesses against thee? But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. In John 5, 22 and 23, 
He said, For the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which sent him. Then, of course, we have to consider Jesus' heaven and hell statements. There's, there's a lot there. I mean, these things that Jesus said when he talked about heaven, hell, you only get that from someone who comes from the other side or either is not rational or sane. And I'm not going to even go close to rational or sane. I know better. He handles situations no one could have possibly handled. And in no way, I've been over the Lord, liar, and lunatic thing, and lunatic doesn't even come close to comparing to this man called Jesus of Nazareth. But he made heaven and hell statements, and those heaven and hell statements, they're big statements. Jesus actually spoke of hell as much as he spoke of heaven. I mean, the only way you can know about what's on the other side is to talk to someone who's been on the other side, and in this case, that's the assumption. Christ knows about the other side. Actually, he created the other side. There are numerous resurrections recorded within the pages of Scripture. I know a lot of times what we think of is we think of Lazarus, Lazarus being raised by Jesus from the dead. And that's probably the biggest one because he was in the grave four days. But there were more resurrections that took place within the pages of the Bible, both Old Testament as well as New Testament. There was the widow of Zarephath's son, the Shunammite woman's son, the man that was raised out of Elisha's grave, the widow of Nain's son, Jairus' daughter was raised by Jesus, and then there's Lazarus, which we mentioned. Various saints at Jerusalem, when Jesus died on the cross, were resurrected, and then after he was resurrected, they went into the city and told individuals in the city about what he had accomplished at Calvary. There was Tabitha, who was also called Dorcas, and then there was Eutychus. These people, when they came back from the dead, told us nothing about what's on the other side. Perhaps it's not permitted for them to speak about those things. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 3 and 4 says, I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Now, most people think that was Paul when he was stoned and left for dead at Ephesus, but he put it in the third person. I'm not sure, but I do know one thing. None of those people who came back from the dead talked about what's on the other side. But Jesus did speak about what's on the other side. He described heaven and hell as being real places, a place of treasures when it comes to heaven, a place prepared by God and the Holy Spirit and Christ himself a place of joy and rest, a place of reward, a place where there are angels and archangels and cherubim and seraphim, a place where there are mansions and dwelling places, a place where there are great feasts and fellowship, a place where the redeemed do and will dwell with God forever, eternally happy and in a perfect state of existence. But he also talked of hell, a real place, a place where men will find destruction. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, everlasting punishment, unquenchable fire. These things, and it doesn't matter if you take the position of eternal conscious torment or conditional immortality. The fact is, this is a terrible, terrible place that you and I do not want to go. It is a place of everlasting destruction. Jesus told us about the other side, heaven, hell. And here's the thing, eternity looms. If I could show you the other side, what it's like to be in heaven, you would do whatever you had to do in order to get there. If I could show you what that's like, you would do everything you had to do, everything you needed to do to respond to this grace and love and salvation that God's granted us. You'd do all of that to get there. Now, we aren't just interested in what he said. We also need to ask the question, what did he do? Well, the Bible says he went about doing good. Acts 10 and verse 38, Peter would actually tell the household of Cornelius and Gentiles who were about to be brought into the kingdom, brought into the church, he would say in Acts 10 and verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. 
In John the 10th chapter, in verses 30 through 32, I and my Father are one, Jesus would say. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? Jesus did miracle after miracle. The miracles of Jesus fall into one of four categories. Miracles over nature, miracles of supply, miracles of healing, and miracles over the spiritual realm. Nobody knows how many miracles Jesus did. One individual suggested that he performed 33 miracles. I'd inform him to read the Bible again. I read the New Testament, read the Gospels. In John 20, verses 30 through 31, the Bible says, Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. In John 21 and verse 25, the Bible says, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. His miracles accomplished something that words alone could not. They confirmed his claim that he was God, the Son, the second person of the Godhead. I mean, when he told the wind and the waves to be still, when he fed 5,000 and then later 4,000 with a few fish and a few loaves, when he healed lepers and lame and deaf and dumb, when he opened the eyes of the blind and when he opened the eyes of one who was born blind and when he raised the dead and one that had been in the grave for four days, when he did that, everybody took notice. It wasn't just what he said. It was what he did. People believed then. Jesus also fulfilled specific prophecies, prophecies that were unique to his life and his ministry and his words. The Bible actually says that he would teach in parables, Psalm 78, verse 1 and verse 2. He did that. The Bible says that he would begin his ministry in Galilee, Isaiah 9, verses 1 through 2. He did that. The Bible says that his ministry would be marked by miracles, Isaiah 35, 5, and 6. It was. The Bible says that his ministry would be marked by a forerunner, namely John the Baptist, Isaiah 40, verses 3 and 4. It was. He would triumphantly enter into Jerusalem on a donkey, Zechariah 9 and verse 9. He did. He would be forsaken by God, Psalms 22 and verse 1. And as he hung on the cross, he was. Some would argue that he had control over those prophecies. In other words, he could tell his disciples to go and get the donkey and he would ride into Jerusalem. Uh, okay, you're right about that. He did. And I'll deal with that argument in a few moments. But he practiced what he preached. Now you may ask, what do you mean by that? He preached that men should pray for their enemies. He did that from the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He preached that men should turn the other cheek. He did that. He preached that men should diligently pray. And if you read the Gospels, he is constantly pulling aside and going and praying, sometimes all night. He preached that men should live lives of goodness. And that is exactly what he did. He preached that men should be forgiving. And he was he preached that men should love God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, and he did. He preached that men should love people, and he did. He preached that men should do God's will, even if it brings about death, and he did. He practiced what he preached. I mean, Jesus did things no one ever did. He said things no one ever said when men were actually sent to arrest him from the Sanhedrin, they came back empty-handed. And when the Sanhedrin said, why didn't you bring him? They said, never a man spoke like this man. He did things no one ever did. He said things no one ever said. As the people of his day debated if he was, in fact, the Messiah, some asked, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? What did he say? What did he do? The answers to those questions testify as to who he was. And when the Bible says, come now, let us reason together, 
it's logical that we ask these questions and then examine the evidence regarding Christ. Now, we need to ask the question, why do billions believe in it? Well, again, we fall back to fulfilled prophecy. From what I understand, there are 353 Old Testament prophecies that pointed to Christ. And Jesus would not have control over all of these different prophecies. Some he would. I mentioned it earlier. I'd come back to it, so here I am. Some he did have control over, but he would not have control over others. He would be from the seed of woman, Genesis 3 in verse 15. Remember that God said to the devil, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. You shall bruise his heel, but he shall crush your head. If you remember, that's a reference to Christ having to go to the cross, being bruised, bruised his heel, but in that event, he would also crush the devil's head. He would deal him a mortal wound. He would be the seed of Abraham. All nations would be blessed through him, Genesis 12 and verse 3. He would be of the tribe of Judah, Genesis 49 and verse 10. He would be born in Bethlehem, Micah 5 and verse 2. He would be born of a virgin, Isaiah 7 and verse 14. He would be heir to King David's throne, Isaiah 9 and verse 7. He would spend a season in Egypt, Hosea 11 and verse 1, and there would be a slaughter of the innocents in his birth city, Jeremiah 31 and verse 15. He would be rejected by his own people, Psalm 69 and verse 8, Isaiah 53 and verse 3. He would be declared to be the Son of God, Psalms 2 and verse 7. He would be called a Nazarene, Isaiah 11 and verse 1. He would be called a priest after the order of Melchizedek, Psalms 110 and verse 4. He would be called a king, Psalms 2 and verse 6, Zechariah 9 and verse 9. He would be praised by children, Psalms 8 and verse 2. He would be betrayed by a close friend, Psalms 41 and verse 9. The price of his betrayal would be 30 pieces of silver, Zechariah 11, 12 and 13. That 30 pieces of silver would be used to buy a potter's field, Zechariah 11, 12, and 13. He would be spat upon and struck, Isaiah 50 and verse 6. He would be killed with criminals, Isaiah 53 and verse 12. He would be given vinegar to drink, Psalm 69 and verse 21. His hands and his feet would be pierced, Psalms 22 and verse 16, Zechariah 12 and verse 10. And I'll remind you here, crucifixion had not even been invented when that prophecy was stated a thousand years prior to Christ's coming. Crucifixion was invented in about 60 B.C., by the Assyrians and the Romans took it and perfected it as a form of execution. Those who put him to death would cast lots for his garments, Psalms 22 and verse 18. Not one of his bones would be broken, Psalms 34 and verse 20. When they came to break the legs of those who were crucified, Jesus had already died and his legs were not broken. He would be buried with the rich, Isaiah 53 and verse 9. He would be resurrected, Psalms 16 and verse 10, Psalms 49 and verse 15. He would ascend into heaven, Psalms 24, 7 through 10, Daniel 7 and verse 13. Listen, the chances that one man could fulfill all 350 prophecies of the Old Testament, a statistician actually calculated this and said it was 1 in 10 to the 157th power. That's a one with 157 zeros behind it. That's Don Stoner, a physicist and a statistician that made that calculation. So what is that? How do you, how do you even get those numbers? There's an illustration that's been put forth that if you covered the state of Texas with silver dollars three foot deep, and then you painted one silver dollar, flew over the state of Texas, and somewhere over the state of Texas, you threw that one red silver dollar that you had painted red. You threw it out the window of the plane. It landed in Texas. You stared it all up, dropped in a man, and said you have one chance, blindfolded, to pick up the silver dollar that's painted red. That's the chances that Jesus could fulfill all the prophecies, all 353 prophecies of the Old Testament. It would never happen. So all of these prophecies that Jesus had no control over, those prophecies, 
he fulfilled. Now, when we consider the empty tomb, the central determining event regarding Christ being the son of the living God is the empty tomb. If there would have been a body to exhume from that tomb and parade up and down Main Street to prove that Jesus did not rise from the dead, let me tell you something, the Sanhedrin, they would have done it. They wouldn't have cared how gross it was. They would not have cared. They would have done that in a heartbeat to prove Jesus did not resurrect from the dead. But it makes sense. It makes sense that God created a perfect world, put man in it. Man disobeyed and in essence rebelled against God. God's justice demanded that payment be made for sin. The wages of sin is death. And God sent Christ into the world to die for man to take away the sins of the world and to satisfy divine justice in the very same event, the cross. You see, the cross and hell are built on the same foundation, God's justice. Don't think for a moment that God doesn't love you. He does. If you don't get God's love, by looking at the cross, you're blind in one eye and can't see out of the other. But God's justice is at the cross of Calvary. Christ satisfied the justice of God. God couldn't just sweep what was wrong away and say, it's okay, I'm going to overlook your sin. No, God is perfect. He is divine holiness and justice. Justice had to be satisfied. Christ stepped forward and said, I'll go. God said, go. And the justice of God was satisfied at the cross of Christ. And there, God's justice and God's love was demonstrated to a world that so desperately needed it. And that explains everything. It explains everything. It explains the origin of the universe, life on earth, intelligent design, good and evil, consciousness, that age-old question, why am I here? You're here for a lot of reasons. You're here to learn a lot of things, but ultimately, you're here to choose. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Is it going to be God? Is it going to be Christ? He changed the world. There's never been anyone like him. There'll never be anyone like him. I pray, I pray that you'll get that. Thanks for being here this evening. We're glad you were here. That ends our lesson for tonight. Don't forget to share the page on your Facebook channel or if you're watching again on YouTube that you click all the buttons and all the bells and all the whistles and you can share that as well. But thank you for being here this evening. We hope you'll share the page and be back next Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. And listen, if you're in the Wabash area and you have the opportunity to stop in and worship with us at the Church of Christ at Wabash, we'd love to have you. You'd honor us with your presence. But thank you for being here this evening. If if you have any questions about anything said or done, please write them in the comment section below the stream, and I'll be happy to get back with you with a Bible answer. I'll give you a Bible answer to a Bible question. But thanks for being here. Be safe this coming week. God bless you. See you on Sunday.